Drug Free Action Alliance webinar series. Today's series will feature parents who host, lose the most, don't be a party to teenage drinking. I am Derek Longmire, and with me today is Allison Scherer, also with Drug Free Action Alliance. Due to the quantity of callers, all attendees, attendees will be muted throughout the webinar. However, we do want your feedback, so if you have questions, please enter them into the questions pane on your navigation panel. Um, we will have technical related questions answered as they come in. For questions related to programming, uh, we will answer those at the end in our question and answer section. Uh, we've provided about 15 minutes for questions and answers, um, but if they continue to come through, then we will uh, continue to answer them until there are no more questions. Should you have technical difficulties during today's webinar, please contact the GoToWebinar helpline. That number is 800-263-6317, and you will need your webinar ID. Again, that number is 800-263-6317. 6317, and the webinar ID for today is 218-903-561. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Drug Free Action Alliance, we are a nonprofit organization with specialization in program development focused on strengthening community coalitions and enhancing environmental prevention. Drug Free Action Alliance is based in Columbus, Ohio, with programming implemented in all 50 states, as well as U.S. territories and other countries. Uh, for those of you in your community who were not able to join the webinar today, a recording of the session will be available at the Drug Free Action Alliance website within one week, and slides from today's session will also be available on, at drugfreeactionalliance.org. Uh, we learned from the last webinar that there is a slight delay in the slides, so they may be lagging a little bit behind, um, but they will be coming for you. Um, just want to take a moment to briefly talk about the history of kind of how parents who host lose the most don't be a party to teenage drinking came along. Um, in 1998, Congress allocated funds um, through the U.S. Department of Justice to reduce underage drinking. Um, from that, there became the Enforcing Underage Drinking Laws Initiative, also known as UDL. Uh, the one requirement for that, well, there are several requirements, but one of the requirements for that funding is that there must be a law enforcement component related to that funding. All states were eligible re to receive an annual allocation that was also open to the District of Columbia and the U.S. territories. So um, since 1998, there have been a lot of funds uh, going to states related to UDL. Many of those funds were directed purely to law enforcement entities. Ohio was set up a little bit differently that the funds were sent to our single state authority uh, dealing with alcohol and drug issues. And um, from there, they contracted with Drug Free Action Alliance uh, to provide services related to parents who host lose the most, don't be a party to teenage drinking. Um, when the UDL funds came about in 1998, a statewide task force was created. Um, it included state departments, uh, law enforcement entities, prevention-focused agencies, and community coalitions. Uh, this was helped to determine um, what we wanted to do with the funds and what would be most appropriate for Ohio. Um, the task force did complete a needs assessment, and through that needs assessment, they determined that Ohio is a social host state, and which means that it is unlawful for uh, anyone under 21 uh, to possess or consume alcohol. Um, and those that own the property, it is a social host violation if they um, knowingly allow someone to, under the age of 21 to possess or consume alcohol on their property unless it is their own child. Uh, in Ohio, we do have the unless it's your own child stipulation, um, which varies from state to state. Uh, in examining the state and national strategies focused on underage drinking, uh, the majority of the programs that the task force saw were really focused on minors, and there wasn't a whole lot of information available for parents. Um, and there was certainly a little information available related to social host, um, not only for directed at parents, but in general. Um, also, in, in the needs assessment that was conducted, um, it was determined that the primary source of alcohol to youth wasn't social access, or was not um, retail access as it was originally uh, perceived, but it was really that social access. Uh, and so that's where, kind of how the Parents Who Host program came along. Um, before implementing the Parents Who Host program, it's really important to have some data. Uh, if community data indicates that uh, alcohol possession for minors is not through parents, then the Parents Who Host program is not probably the best strategy that you want to continue with. Um, 
So if social access is through, say, siblings of age, um, or uh, si si through siblings or um, friends who are 21 and older, uh, we have another program, Buzzkill, Serve Under 21, and the party's over. Um, we will go into more detail about that at next month's webinar. Um, but just know that when you're identifying uh, resources within your community, make sure that you get the ones that are the right fit. If it turns out that uh, social access isn't your, the community's problem at all, but it's retail access, then focus on things like compliance checks, shoulder taps, responsible beverage service trainings, etc. cetera. Um, when we're looking at uh, the issue in Ohio, um, through the needs assessment, it was really determined that um, the primary access for alcohol to youth was parent-hosted teen house parties. Um, and there's a variety of reasons, as I'm sure you have all heard, as to why parents might uh, choose to host parties, be, being a cool parent, or uh, want to keep kids from drinking and driving, um, or going on with that as the assumption that, well, they're going to drink anyway, so I would rather them doing drinking in my home than uh, somewhere else. Well, while you may make that decision for your own child, uh, it's not really your job or your right to make that decision for uh, another parent's child. Other things that you might hear is that I'd rather my kids drink at home than in the car. I did it when I was in their age, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm sure that you've heard those things within your community, and it would be good to get a sense of what your community members think, uh, particularly when you have those who have been caught uh, either um, through social hosts or through furnishing as to what their rationale was behind that. So when we're looking at um, the Parents Who Host program, um, it's not just about drinking and driving. A lot of times, I think communities members think of um, just take away the car keys and that's going to solve all the problems. Uh, I think that um, MAD has done a phenomenal job at educating about the um, ramifications both through uh, legal health and safety um, with drinking and driving, uh, but it's also important to know or be mindful of all the other things that are associated with drinking and driving that have absolutely nothing to do uh, with, or with alcohol use that has nothing to do with drinking and driving. So um, just a little fun stat here, over 2,000 young people die under 21 uh, every year from non-driving alcohol-related accidents, uh, which include homicide, suicide, um, drownings, falls, and that doesn't even include sexual assaults and other things that, other um, negative things that happen related to underage drinking that has nothing to do with drinking and driving. Um, social hosting and or furnishing is against the law uh, in Ohio and violators can be prosecuted, fined, and even jailed. Research your local community and state laws for penalties associated with social hosting and furnishing alcohol to minors. Um, if you don't have a social host law within your community or state, that doesn't mean that social host or that parents who host won't be a good fit for you. Uh, there's also furnishing and other things that can kind of pop up. Parents play a, role, a major role uh, in their choices, their children's choices to use alcohol. Um, various studies have kind of um, shown how significant a parent's influence is, uh, and it's important that they are helpful in uh, communicating not only their message, but partnering with schools with law enforcement, other businesses to collectively say that um, providing alcohol to minors is just not safe and it's not acceptable. Uh, adolescents, we know, do listen to their parents when it comes to um, alcohol use, tobacco use, other drug use. Uh, so it's important that those parents had those conversations with their, um, their students to really know about that. Also, when we're looking at social hosting um, related to underage drinking parties, it really does send a mis mixed message about the acceptability of drinking. Um, and it shows that students don't have to obey the laws. So uh, that's certainly not a good example that we want to set for our young people that um, we don't really need to be mindful of what the laws are or follow them. And it also con contributes to the misperception that all youth drink uh, when there's just that community norm that, hey, everybody's doing it and it's just part of our culture. Um, if it is a part of the culture, then it's certainly something that should be looked to be addressed uh, because that's certainly not uh, healthy or safe or legal for um, that community. Um, when we're looking at some of the objectives of parents who host, um, there's various community-wide benefits, um, but the prim there's three primary objectives. The first is to educate parents about the health and safety risks of hosting underage drinking parties and or serving alcohol to teens. And while the parents who host message and the gavel represent a legal focus, it is also important to examine the health and safety aspects of hosting 
uh, or serving alcohol to teens. Uh, and looking at the second objective, um, increasing parental awareness of and compliance with state underage drinking laws. Uh, in the eyes of the law, ignorance, ignorance is no excuse. And while many well-meaning parents may choose to uh, host or serve alcohol, um, it's just not something that is legal. And law enforcement won't say, oh, well, you took away their car keys, then you're not at fault. Um, no, that's not acceptable, so law enforcement will continue to pro uh, prosecute with that. And in my opinion, the most important and the longest-lasting longest objective uh, is the third, which is to change community norms related to social hosting. If a community holds and maintains the norms that underage drinking is unsafe, unhealthy, and unacceptable, then parents will feel the pressure to maintain those community norms, and they can work collectively to kind of build on one another, uh, that uh, they will strong stand strong and united that they're not going to host underage drinking parties. So um, we've got those objectives, and we really want to um, be successful in, in reaching those objectives. And uh, the mission of Parents Who Host is to reach parents where they live, where they work, and where they shop, uh, because we know that if you look at these three areas, that's where parents spend the vast majority of their time. And we also know that if they only receive one message, uh, say they see the Parents Who Host, host message on a billboard, um, on their way to work, that that's not that may not be enough to um, increase their awareness, and certainly probably wouldn't be enough to change their behavior uh, related to social hosting. So, to maximize the impact, uh, create multiple places where parents will receive the message. So, we're going to talk about a lot of these places uh, that parents can receive the message, um, and a lot of them are pretty simple, and a lot of them are pretty inexpensive. So, uh, we know that everybody is working on. Uh, limited resources and uh, whether it's time resources or money resources. So we want to be mindful of that and know that there's a variety of ways to get this message out uh, that are, are not expensive. So we want to make sure that parents know the risks. Again, ignorance is no excuse. So uh, just reminding parents that it is illegal to host or allow teen drinking parties in their home. Uh, it is unhealthy for anyone under age 21 to consume alcohol. Uh, it's unsafe and illegal for anyone to drink and drive. Um, the logo itself really speaks to um, the legal aspect, uh, so it's important for communities to focus on the uh, unhealthy and unsafe components related to um, the parents who host message, and also just remind parents that they can be prosecuted under um, Ohio social host law. Uh, if you're not in Ohio uh, and you don't have a social host law, you can also look at um, furnishing alcohol to minors, contributing to the delinquency of minors, if you have uh, nuisance abatement type uh, ordinances uh, such as trash or loud noise, then there might be some opportunities for that as well. So just be creative and think about what your community needs are, what the resources are, and how you can pair the two together. Uh, one of the resources that we have uh, is the Parents Who Host Program Kit. Uh, this is something that's available in the Parents Who Host Member Center at drugfreeactionalliance.org. There is a one-time cost of $50 to become a member, um, but it's just a one-time fee and that will allow you access to over 30 items. Um, we really want to give communities everything that they need in order to be successful in implementing the program. Uh, and the resources provided in the member center are, really are a buffet of things that you can kind of pick and choose from. Um, looking at things that are available to your community, um, there's templates for uh, a scheduling of activities. All of these are resources that have been generated and ideas that have come from communities who have implemented the program. Uh, so we're kind of the, the warehouse for all of those great ideas, and um, through the Member Center, we're able to distribute those ideas uh, throughout communities. So um, the good thing about the Parents Who Host commu Parents Who Host program is that communities decide what strategies are best, and when deciding those strategies, um, be sure to think about what your community buy-in might look like from elected officials, from parents, schools, law enforcement, etc. Um, think about capacity within the community, and also think about community readiness. All these pieces are important and really uh, making sure that your uh, program will be successful. And again, the member center resources are available at drugfreeactionalliance.org. Um, we have them broken out into four categories to make it a little bit easier to use. Um, the four areas are implementing, implementation and planning, uh, ready to use materials, customized components, and program logos. We feel that if we make it as easy for you as possible, then you're going to be more likely to utilize the materials 
And uh, as always, if questions arise, you can contact Drug Free Action Alliance, and we're more than, more than happy to assist you. So in looking at planning and implementation, um, this is a list of some of the resources that we have available. Uh, the program description provides interested, interested communities with a quick uh, two-page synopsis of what the Parents Who Host program is, um, kind of the background behind the program and uh, how it was devised. Um, community engagement strategies are uh, broken down into segments of the community, and there's various things listed as to how you can be successful in, say, uh, engaging law enforced, enforcement to support you in your efforts. Uh, the Community Engagement Strategies Planner uh, takes those community engagement strategies. It breaks it out throughout the year, uh, so you can kind of uh, decide what activities would be most important for various times. Kind of initially, Parents Who Host was really focused on prom and graduation season, um, but that doesn't mean uh, that um, prom and graduation season is the only time in which uh, students drink. So we want to focus on uh, the Parents Who Host message throughout the year uh, because we know that uh, underage drinking and uh, teen parties occur throughout the year and want to be mindful of that. Uh, key messages, um, when working with media or trying to get the message promoted through your community, it's important to kind of have some talking points to kind of go to as your, your place to, to focus on with some key messages. Uh, so those are available along with media tips. Um, sometimes you can have uh, media outlets that are very supportive of your message and others that want to trip you up and uh, try to make a bigger issue of the program's purpose and your efforts. Uh, so we've got some tips there to kind of help you out, as well as some underage drinking facts. Uh, again, it's important that uh, the resources uh, that you provide are as uh, most impactful for your community as possible. Uh, the resources that are available through the Parents Who Host uh, program is either based on the program evaluation that Allison will talk about shortly or uh, national data. If you have data more specific to your community, please use that because that's going to have a stronger impact on your community. Um, looking at planning and implementation, uh, just focused on the business. Uh, business can be a phenomenal partner when you're looking to promote the Parents Who Host message, not only from a financial perspective, but also from a message promotion perspective. Um, so resources that are available are uh, a business newsletter. Uh, there's other strategies for kind of getting um, businesses to help support the message, as well as the corporate reporting form. Uh, I don't know about your communities or your funding structure, but um, in the grants that we apply for, in-kind uh, services is something that is very favorable. And by having a, a form to, for these corporations or these businesses to fill out, that really helps show community support around the Parents Who Host program and helps with the generation of funding as well. Because it shows that uh, the community is supportive. It's not just something that you're trying to do on your own. Um, looking at corporate involvement, um, the corporate partners and strategies should be varied. Um, don't go in with kind of the same ideas for a carryout as you would for um, a an energy business. So make sure that your strategies that you have that you can work with the corporation are varied and really specific to what they could offer. And also look at things not only for their employees, uh, but also for their customers. So uh, the resources available um, should be something that uh, can kind of hit both areas. Because again, we're trying to reach parents where they live, where they work, and where they shop. And whether it's where they work or where they shop, both are equally important uh, outreach areas. So um, within the uh, way that the Parents Who Host program is set up, particularly within the member center, everything is easy to um, customize for your own community. Uh, corporations are um, invited to put their own logo on things. Um, two examples that we have uh, on the screen here are a uh, grocery bag that a grocery store had printed up and distributed out through their four locations. And the um, image on the right-hand side is of a carryout uh, that has the Parents Who Host message on a, a window cling. Uh, so that as patrons come to their establishment, as they're going to get their alcohol out of the coolers, uh, they're reminded that that parents who host message. Um, so hopefully that will uh, be the trigger that they can um, hopefully change their mind and not provide alcohol to minors if that's what their intent was. Um, typically through our business outlets, uh, we reach hundreds of thousands of customers and employees 
um, throughout Ohio annually. Um, because we don't really have a way of, of tracking what the national outreach is through employers, we are only able to um, really kind of measure Ohio. Um, but through the messages within Ohio, uh, we reach, um, we're north of a, a million people now uh, that receive the message just through businesses. Uh, that doesn't include some of the other things, um, such as radio ads, et cetera. Um, looking at corporate involvement, this is just some example of some of the uh, resources that are available. Um, you can do a newsletter to employees or to shareholders. Um, you can have uh, the static links for the coolers like um, the carryout had. Uh, we can have posters in the stores. It could be in the bulletin board as you enter the store, or it could be in an employee break room. Um, fact cards are a three by eight information card um, that really talks about um, the parents who host program and reasons as to why it's not a good idea for parents to host. Um, those could go into bag, uh, grocery bags or other shopping bags or payroll stuffers. Um, you could also look at um, working with um, those that send out bills to insert information related to that. Um, we work with Columbia Gas of Ohio, who has 1.2 million residential customers. And something that they do each April is put in uh, a story about their, the Parents Who Host program in uh, the newsletter that they send out to their customers each month. Uh, you can also work, on, um, w work with your cable stations for PSA placement. Um, a lot of them are required to have uh, a certain amount of time blocked for PSAs, and what better way uh, than uh, using the Parents Who Host message and some of the things that you're working on in your community to really promote that. And something that's been popular uh, is in-store public announcements uh, of a Parents Who Host ad. Um, whether it's a, a grocery store or um, a clothing department store, um, they many times do in-store announcements, and it's great to have that um, reminder go through there, particularly in the evenings uh, when parents might be preparing for those parties that they may be hosting for uh, or at other key times, such as uh, homecoming or prom, uh, other areas that are, are kind of big like that. Um, looking at some of the ready-to-use materials, these are very focused. Um, that includes a message from our honorary chair, uh, Clark Kellogg, who is um, most noted as the CBS analyst for college basketball, uh, is our honorary chair. Uh, he's also a, a trustee for The Ohio State University and is a vice president for the Indiana Pacers. Uh, so he has a lot of notoriety, particularly within um, the realm of basketball and athletes. Uh, so he's been a phenomenal partner to really get that message out to that athletic community. Because we know that athletes um, statistically are more likely to drink underage than non-athletes. So uh, he's been wonderful in not only connecting with the athletes, but connecting with the athletes' parents. Um, a community presentation, uh, PowerPoint presentations available for you to present to communities. Uh, it's set up in a way that's easy to update. It's just a PowerPoint. Uh, so you can drop in your own local information and also legal health and safety issues. Uh, again, we want to focus on not only the legal aspect of social hosting, but also, also the health and safety aspects. Uh, so some of those things are available for you as well. And a great strategy that uh, community used, and I, can't, I think it was Oregon, I can't remember for sure, um, was they went to their school library, uh, and they put the parents who host information on all of their, their schools in the library. And that reached the, par the, the students. Um, but also for the parenting classes that they had in the evening, um, the parents accessed that school library, so they were reminded of that message um, every time that they accessed those school, compu school computers. Um, Ready-to-use materials that are specific to parents. Um, we have a parent survey, survey on underage alcohol use. Um, again, Allison's going to go into greater detail about um, what the, the information related to the survey is, um, but the survey is available to you to use within your communities. Uh, to help get a sense of not only um, what parents' knowledge is, knowledge is around um, social hosting uh, and their kind of their beliefs, but also um, if they know if other parents are um, providing alcohol to minors, etc. Um, the parent-student engagement assignment is a great example that came out of Southwest Ohio. Um, this is a something that a um, health teacher came up with, and he wanted to during prom time. Um, take in this the underage drinking aspect, and he made it a requirement for his students to um, take information about the state social host law, uh, go home to their parents, 
interview their, par their parents, the students' parents, about their knowledge and attitudes uh, related to the social host law and write a one to two page paper about what they found. So not only did it help spur a conversation between um, the students and, and the teacher around social hosting, but it also forced a conversation between the students and the parents around social hosting. And it was a very creative way of getting that information to parents um, that would be completely different than uh, just kind of seeing that billboard as they drive to work. So um, there's a lot of inventive things that can be done to get that message in the parent's hand. Um, we've worked with parents uh, in multiple capacities here, and it's always challenging to kind of connect with them, uh, particularly when you host these big events and you, the audience is parents. Uh, the audience of parents that come may not necessarily be the audience of parents that need to be there. Uh, so this is a great way to really reach all parents uh, within that school within this message. Um, and then two other things are party tips for parents. So uh, whether their parent or they're hosting a party at their house or whether their child's going to attend a party at someone else's house, there's um, tips there. And there's also a fact sheet for parents about the legal health and safety is issues and risks associated with social hosting. Um, community leader proclamation is available. Um, as part of those pieces of connecting with various spokes of the community wheel, um, elected officials are certainly a, an integral part within that. Uh, so there's a sample proclamation that a, either a, a mayor or a city council member can sign. Uh, there's a sample newsletter that you can uh, work off of, as well as sample press releases, op editorials, and um, these are all, again, in Word format that you can easily customize. Um, Another thing are some PSA scripts. Um, the scripts that are available are samples, um, and it comes from three different perspectives. There's just kind of an overall general community perspective. Um, there's a, spec a perspective from law enforcement, and the one that's shown to be most impactful uh, is the perspective from students uh, asking for their parents to be their parents and not friends, and really to support them in making healthy decisions and uh, supporting the underage drinking laws within the state. The print ready resources that are available, um, we want to make, again, make the Parents Who Host program as easy as possible to implement. So we have uh, the logo in both EPS, which is high resolution. So if you want to do that billboard uh, or have it on the side of a big building, um, that high resolution artwork is available to you. Um, or if you're doing up your own newsletter and you're just going to print it off in your printer, uh, then you have the JPEG that you can just slap that on uh, and go with. So we really want to make sure that the resources are customizable and available to meet the needs of the community. Uh, the Parents Who Host program works um, for a variety of reasons. Um, simply, it's a turnkey initiative with the buffet of resources that we provide you. Um, you're able to just kind of pick and choose what works with, within uh, the kind of the confines or capacity of your community. Um, it really does support greater involvement between coalitions and law enforcement. Uh, a lot of times, coalitions uh, have some challenges with recruiting law enforcement, and particularly there could be um, fractions of law enforcement that may not always play well with one another. Shocking, I know. Um, but this really kind of brings everybody together, and we want to help raise awareness about parents who host and uh, have this preventative message so law enforcement can focus on uh, more important crimes and things that uh, might get bigger community attention than maybe an underage drinking party, so we can be more preventative on that side and save law enforcement from um, using some of their resources that could be directed in other areas um, for this outlet. Uh, and also, the community determine, determines um, what resources they want to focus on. They determine the, the timing. They determine what works best for them. Uh, so there's a lot of um, flexibility and ability to really mold the parents who host message into something that is really going to work for the community. At this point, I will turn things over to Allison, who is now going to talk about the evaluation component behind Parents Who Host. Great. It, if you were able to hear Allison, uh, it, I'm getting some messages that we can't. Uh, evidently, Allison is, her headset might have gone out. 
Uh, so we will just pass you over to me. So it'll show that I am talking, but really it's Allison. I'm not throwing my voice. Here you go, Allison. Ah, technology. It makes for so much fun. So hopefully this is okay and you all can hear me okay. If you can't, please do use that questions pane to let Derek know if you're continuing to have any problems and he'll try to help you from that side. But it sounds like we're getting the thumbs up. So sorry about that. So as we're looking at the um, evaluation questions and questions that we get, I just want to ease into that a little bit first by just talking about the amount of recognition this program has had and how widely it's been replicated. Uh, so when we're looking at uh, 2001, uh, we're going to talk more about this piece in just a minute, but CSAP through SAMHSA and um, the original version of NREP did find uh, and acknowledge uh, Parents Who Host as a Promising Prevention Program Award winner. So we're going to come back and talk about that in just a bit. We've also been recognized here in our own state. Uh, 2001, we got the Exemplary Prevention Program Award. We know that since 2001, we are now being highly replicated, and not just in a few places, but in multiple places in many, um, well, all 50 states. But for a long time, um, we may have only had like one group in one state. We're, we're very widespread throughout pretty much all 50 states now with this program. We're also in the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Canada, and Japan. Um, we did not start out with that as our goal. We started out with funding for our state to spread this message and, and have more community-based environmental change and community norms change at the local level throughout Ohio around social access to alcohol and the parental role. Um, but by doing a lot of presentations about our program locally throughout the state and nationally, uh, and how easy it really is to replicate and how freely and willingly we were to share it and, and, and give it um, very easily to others, it really did spread like wildfire. And uh, some of that spreading like wildfire is, is that it is such a simple standalone message, even in just the logo. But then the ancillary materials and other pieces that come with it and how easy they are to replicate and get out, all those other collateral materials. Uh, the customizability of it, um, that it was very inexpensive. So that was part of why it spread so quickly and nationally so early in our own implementation of the program. That it kind of like when I, when I came to work here in 2006, we used to make the joke, wow, the horse is out of the barn. Uh, it is way out of the barn running wild in the pasture. And um, at that point, as you're going to see with some things with NREP and where we already were, it created some barriers for us uh, as we looked at our evaluation, actually. So it was a good and bad problem to have. So I want to talk about NREP. Um, originally, NREP, for those of you familiar with that term, uh, may know it differently. But originally, NREP stood for the National Registry of Effective Prevention Programs. And in its initial incarnation, 1,100 programs applied to be acknowledged as either a model program, an effective program, or a promising program. And 150 programs got one of those designations. And in 2001, Parents Through Host was one of the ones that was designated as a pro promising program. And some of why we weren't any further is because we were still very young. I mean, we really got started in 98 with our funding and really didn't roll out until like 99, 2000 here in Ohio. This was very early in, in the implementation of the program, so we just didn't have the evaluation um, results in yet. So that's why we were a promising program. In 2006, um, as we continue to trunk along and do our implementation here in our state and help other states as best as we could as, as they were starting to implement things as well, um, we found that uh, NREP was changing. SAMHSA put out a uh, notice to everybody that NREP was now going to stand for the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices, expanded to include some mental health and mental health promotion. We also had um, some new criteria. Uh, that were put into that system, and then all 150 programs that were previously certified under NREP had to reapply. So we had our original evaluation design that was already in place before all these new criteria, and it did not have any kind of control group. Uh, and in fact, I mean, it was evaluation on a shoestring. When you really look at the amount of money needed to do research the way the new NREP criteria is, much less that we were, you know, five years down the road now with an evaluation design already in place that was um, good, but certainly wasn't at that research level that NREP needed. So for our approach, for our reapplication in 2006, our program um, had already been running, again, statewide for years, included a lot of media messaging across very diverse channels, whether it's TV, print, billboard, 
movie ads, um, but it was more than just a messaging campaign. There are other local level environmental changes that communities were working on. Um, but our survey design had always had a component in about exposure to the actual message. And in 2007, NREP did approve for us that we could use something called propensity score matching. And don't ask any questions about that, because that's, that's as much as I'm going to be able to tell you about that, because uh, I'm not our evaluator. Um, but it was a, a, a new design that we could use of how to relook at the data we already had. And what we were going to do is utilize the existing data and see if we could create a pseudo control group out of the respondents who said that they could not recall specifically hearing that message and then see how the rest of their survey answers compared to the folks who did recall seeing the message. Um, so the good news and the bad news is that, unfortunately, the number of respondents who had not heard the program message was really too low to proceed. We did not have a high enough end to make that statistically viable as, as a design in the end. Um, so within Ohio, the good news is the program consistently, over every year, a very large margin more of those respondents had recognized and heard the message, parents who host lose the most, don't be a party to teenage drinking, than had heard mad, prom promise, the generic just don't drink and drive, and dare. That we had greater brand recognition than those very four core things that we feel like people hear all the time. So that's great, but it was really a barrier for us for our new research design because our level of messy saturation. So we started to look over the next year with our evaluator at, is there a community somewhere in the United States with similar laws to us who's not yet implemented this program? Hey, good news. No. Bad news for the evaluation, good news for the program um, and its utilization. Again, it's been so easy to replicate that it spread like wildfire. So really where we're at is at, at, by 2007, 2008, we didn't have a data set that could be utilized for the new NREP designations uh, and application process. Um, we didn't have the capacity because the money was shifting and the priorities were changing. And um, then soon thereafter, the UDL money, uh, everything started to really shift. We actually shifted into a new program that we're going to do a webinar next year called Buzzkill, addressing the social hosting uh, on college campuses, which Derek will talk more about here before we wrap up the webinar. But um, a lot that, that evaluation dollars really went to that new program where we did put in a, a control group design uh, right away because we learned our lesson. Um, so really tough stuff. But the good news is, we do have very consistent positive findings from a scientifically done evaluation of random surveying here in Ohio um, between 2001 to 2008. And the trend data on this is very positive, especially in some key measures that are the ones I'm going to share with you in our limited time today. So let me go ahead and just tell you a little bit about this per program evaluation design. Applied Research Center out of Miami University uh, through Dr. Robert Suford, he's the director, um, designed this evaluation for us. And from 2001 to 2008, we conducted annually a survey in June and July, quickly following on the heels of our, our biggest push, even though Parents Who Host is a year-round program, the biggest push is always around prom and graduation time when those parties uh, and parents hosting those kinds of parties uh, are more predominant. Uh, so we do a household survey, uh, and through census data, we're able to identify households with teen population, and we would survey the parents first and then ask the parent if we could also speak to the teen. So you're going to see in some of these data set pictures, sometimes three columns, where you've got all parents, and then you have matched parents and matched youth. And those two bars on the bar graphs for, that say matched are from households where we spoke to both the parent and the youth. Uh, otherwise, we're looking at just all parents combined. So um, as we take a look at the survey tools, we're going to send those out to you. Uh, we're not sending them out to you, but if you uh, become a member on our member center, you will have access through the program kit that's now online in our member center. You will have access to those survey tools. There's both an adult and a youth survey. They're very long, I'll be honest with you. I've always thought they were too long. We've all kind of always thought they've been way too long. But they are tested, scientifically valid, reliable questions that you can pull from to create your own questionnaires. Please feel free to use that as, as you wish. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at the comparison data from 2001 to 2008 uh, and in our key measures. I think we're going to do a, a changeover. We're going to do a quick switch um, for me to, for sound. So Derek, can you double check? Everyone can hear me okay? And, all right, excellent. 
Thank you, Derek. All right, so just to wrap this up, we've got about four key findings uh, in the amount of time we have that I definitely wanted to spend time uh, with us taking a look at. Our first, of course, very important measure is whether or not the child reports that they've attended a party where alcohol was served or if the parent says, you know, has, has my, do I know if my child has attended a party where alcohol was served? And the more important measure, though they're all going in the direction overall that you mostly want, it's really the kids. The kids are saying that that's gone down, and the kids are going to know that uh, certainly more than the parents may know. Next measure that was very important was um, whether or not the parent or the child knew of parents who host parties where alcohol is, a, or is available to teens. And that overall trend is going certainly in the right direction with a 30% decrease among youth and a 22% decrease among parents. We also see trend data looking really good for our other key measure of if parents knew this information, do we think that it would keep them from hosting teen parties? Everyone thought this information was very important for everyone to get, especially parents, with a 33% increase among parents saying, keep that messaging coming. Parents need to know this. And then think about that. If you're a parent who's trying to hold the line with your own kid and you feel like your neighbor or your kid's friend's parents are undercutting you, um, you need support from the community. Uh, it does take a village, and, and those other villagers need to be on the same page. So parents do appreciate when there's consistency across parents and, and that we're all on board doing the same thing. Real important other measure, because we know through lots of research that um, if parents are regularly having conversations with their teens about their expectations and about alcohol and other drugs, um, that we want to see an increase in those conversations. So one of our measures also is whether or not the information led to a discussion about the dangers of going to parties where alcohol is served. Uh, and I think it's great that we see uh, an increase among parents. That could be the good parent syndrome. Uh, so I'm more interested in the youth measure here. And we're seeing a 32% increase among youth who say, yes, their parents have had those conversations with them. So that was very powerful to see those those four key trends. There are certainly other trend data from our research as well, but those are some of our key measures um, that are, have always been a focus for us uh, as a sign of success. Um, that is, that um, information is also available on our website. And um, I believe Derek's going to take it from here, see what questions we have. Thank you, Allison. And we do have some questions. Uh, some of them we can answer together. Uh, the first question that I have, and I don't know if you had any from earlier in the session, um, does this law make it easier for police to enter the home uh, if they feel an underage drinking party is in progress from Mary Lou? Um, Mary Lou, that really doesn't uh, increase access to a home. Um, what it does is it provides another charge that uh, law enforcement might be able to go after um, that may be a little bit easier than, say, a contributing to the delinqu delinquency of a minor charge um, or other things related to that. Uh, the next question is, um, which of your practices have been most successful in reaching parents who want to be their child's friend slash the cool parent uh, and or lack a backbone to set limits on their tweens, teens, college students? From Patricia. Um, Patricia, really the strategies have been varied uh, depending on the community. As Allison had said, really maximizing that parent consistency uh, is an important piece to um, get that on board. And also some parent-to-parent -parent peer pressure. Um, and really setting the tone that it is not your right as a parent, as my kid's parent, uh, to parent my child. Uh, I'm their parent, so it is uh, my job. Uh, so that's, that's kind of uh, an approach that you can take, but it really just depends on the community, what the capacity of the community is, and uh, what resources are available. Um, everybody kind of approaches the parents who host from a different perspective. Um, some communities are very on board, uh, so they have a lot of that parent buy-in already. Others, they have to work for it a little bit. So it really just depends on where your community is at. And a good way to get a sense of that is that uh, the survey that Allison had mentioned. Um, the shorter version is 13 or 14 questions and will help get at uh, those issues much more easily than um, uh, the longer survey might. Uh, but you're certainly welcome to uh, do any of the, the survey in the fuller version if you so desire. And I'm just continuing to scroll through. Um, have online ads been done and is it permissible as an evidence-based success or uh, has there been evidence-based success with them? Um, communities have done ads online um, focused on um, things that parents might be focused in. 
That is not one of the components that we evaluated through uh, our um, phone based survey. Uh, so at the time, we didn't do any advertising related to online, uh, but it has been done. Um, so Tim, I, that's the best that I can tell you really. Um, I, we don't have any evidence in terms of evaluation data so, to support it, um, but it is a good uh, cost effective way to um, get your message out there. Um, so from a message distribution perspective, it seems like that would be um, something that would be good. Um, would you consider broadening your target audience to adults who host lose the most? So landlords who rent um, beach or mountain resort houses to under 21 uh, consistently spell out in their lease consequences if the property is used for underage drinking, e.g. penalty fines, parents notified, etc. Thank you, Patricia. That is a great question, and it's one that we get off, asked an awful lot. Um, they want to know um, what about um, adults who host or people who host uh, or those who host. Um, persuasion research really indicates that a targeted message with a specific audience is the most effective. And for the parents who host message, um, parents are that target audience. And a watered down message would not be as effective. Um, individuals don't relate to, uh, and they don't internalize with words such as uh, adults. They may be an adult, but they don't really look at themselves as one, or, or uh, people who host, for instance. Um, so research has indicated that students have, uh, have a negative response to the red lettering and the gavel as well. So if we're looking at other areas, such as college students, um, also they might the students might have seen this messaging directed to their parents when uh, they were in high school, so that that can turn them off. Um, so we want to have uh, our programs specifically designated um, for uh, audiences. So uh, parents who host is the message specifically designated for um, for parents. We do have one uh, buzzkill serve under twenty one and the party's over. Uh, that will be the focus of the next webinar um, that will be next month. And as soon as the screen can cooperates, um, that logo will be uh, up. So um, Buzzkill would be something that would be more uh, for uh, other audiences. Um, it's primarily focused on college age students um, who might host to, for those that are under 21. Uh, but that's another option that you have that doesn't really focus on parents. But um, from a persuasion research uh, perspective, we really want to make sure that the parents who host is targeted for parents. Parents, Thank you for that question, Patricia. Uh, do you see a difference in implementation between, between rural and urban areas? Um, that is a great question. And we did uh, a, some mini grants related to that. Uh, in some urban settings, uh, a, a phenomenon that I wasn't familiar with, I'm from a rural setting, uh, was card parties uh, where families uh, come together in a house uh, drinking may be occurring upstairs with the parents and downstairs in the basement with the students, uh, and the two should never meet. Um, that's not something that I'm familiar with from my background, um, but there was some specific messaging towards that. Um, so it's really important to look at your community, uh, see how you can get this message to fit with um, the kind of the the format or the the, the norms of your community and kind of go from there. So uh, we have some, seen some differences there in just um, the activities that are, are done um, within different communities. But interestingly enough, looking at the survey data with Franklin County, which is Columbus, Ohio, and its surrounding areas, um, Franklin County was identified because of its mix of urban, suburban, and rural areas. And in terms of message recognition and understanding, there were no variances there. Um, Will this presentation be emailed to, to uh, participants? Jacqueline, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, as uh, I did with the um, no program webinar, uh, when it is, the recording is completed and is made available, I will uh, email that out to everyone. So we will certainly have that available to you. Uh, the next question, where and when do you suggest we survey parents and students? Uh, Kelly, that is a great question. And it is as is, is varied as a community can be. Um, we did a phone-based survey um, for the big survey that Allison was talking about, um, and there's challenges there, reaching parents with phones, having a phone bank available to use, um, other things related to that. Um, communities have just passed it out at basketball games, so it really just depends on what the capacity is and how scientific you want to be with it. Um, 
and it can be varied. Um, one community used SurveyMonkey, which is the tool that you'll actually use to complete your survey. Um, and the first 10 questions of Survey SurveyMonkey is free. Uh, otherwise, I think their monthly uh, fee for SurveyMonkey is somewhere around $20 a month, so it's pretty inexpensive. Um, for that, you'd have to have parent email addresses or um, be able to, through the schools, connect with parents. Uh, so that resource is uh, a potential option for you as well. Um, so just think of as creatively as possible. If you're looking for something really scientific, um, then a phone-based survey is what we used. Um, but for that, I would talk to an evaluator because that goes beyond my capacity of knowledge. Um, Michael, uh, you mentioned next month's webinar. Yes, we are doing Drug Free Action Alliance webinar series. Um, we're doing a feature of each Drug Free Action Alliance program. We're doing one program a month. Uh, the next webinar will be on December 10th and feature our Buzzkill Serve Under 21 and the Parties Over program. And our uh, special guest will be Kelly Weber and one of her graduate students, and she's with Mount U or the University of Mount Union. Uh, so that will be coming up next month. Uh, how do you find out if you have a membership with Parents Who Host? Uh, we run the campaign, but I have never seen some of the materials you listed in the PowerPoint. Um, great question. You can email me at dlongmire at drugfreeactionalliance.org and uh, my information will be coming to your screen shortly uh, and we can check to see if you have uh, a membership with the member center. Um, prior to the member center we had a, a program CD that we had sent out so with one of the benefits of the member center is that uh, you don't have to renew your membership every year uh, because we'll update that membership information uh, so you'll, or the member center information, so you'll always have that, um, the most up-to-date information available. Oh, yes, sorry, one, one time cost of $50, as opposed to the annual cost related to the program kits. Um, I have a question from Louisa. Uh, law enforcement usually responds to noise complaints, um, and do you promote the, uh, it's a 866 under 21 tip line. Um, noise complaints are not a high priority for a lot of law enforcement, particularly if you don't have an ordinance against noise in your community. So that's not necessarily um, the best way um, to get law enforcement to respond. However, you're much better to get them to respond if you do have some type of nuisance abatement, such as noise ornament ordinance. So if you do have something there, then they're going to be more likely to respond, but they're not going to see it as an, an, an immediate need. And for the under 21 tip line, we had our own tip line in Ohio, and that's what we promoted. Um, that is no longer available, and quite honestly, I wasn't familiar with the under 21 tip line. And, and, and yeah, Louisa, that might be a tip line local in your own community. I, I'm not familiar with that. Um, I, I doubt there is a national tip line that would then get you to your local law enforcement. Um, that would be incredibly rare. And there might be something statewide, or there might be something um, town to town, um, but that, that's potentially more localized. Uh, so maybe that clarifies that. And a question from Don, uh, from John, excuse me. What if a parent gives another parent permission to allow their child to drink at a party? Uh, could the parent who distributes the alcohol be found liable? Um, there's no such thing as parent permission in Ohio. Um, the only way that a parent can allow their child to um, drink alcohol under the age of 21 is if they are, uh, as the law indicates, within arm's reach. Um, so the parent has to be with the child during alcohol consumption. Um, there's no, they can't provide permission to a parent. Um, so that would be something that we'd certainly want to focus on um, in your social host ordinance uh, if you don't have one. Um, each ordinance uh, or state law is different, uh, so you'd want, you'd want to check yours. Uh, but the way that the Ohio is set up is that you can't provide, you can't, a parent cannot give permission uh, for another parent to um, provide alcohol to their child. Um, do you have graphics or a PSA that can be run at movie theater? Uh, thank you, Louisa. Uh, we have the Big Mistake PSA, um, and it's available on the Drug Free Action Alliance YouTube channel. Uh, you can also purchase the DVD. Um, depending on the format of the theater, um, some of them that still use the 35 millimeter film, which is becoming more and more rare, thankfully. Um, we don't have it in a format such as that, uh, but the DVD is available, and uh, many theaters are using that. Uh, have you been able to track specific community data over time that has shown a direct correlation, correlation between using the strategy and youth access and in turn decrease in youth consumption? Um, that is a great question and 
And it comes from Sandy Hinkle, who knows better than that question. <laughs> um, so the reality is, you know, as I, as I look at that question, the words like direct correlation between any strategy, and, and um, certainly you might see that a, a direct correlation, you know, as we implemented this program, we saw a decrease in youth access or youth report of access or youth report of parents hosting parties, uh, and then in turn a decrease in youth consumption. As with any kind of environmental change or coalition work, we're always looking at our uh, how do we analyze our level of contribution to a change? Um, for our statewide evaluation, um, as you may know, Sandy, we don't have statewide data here in Ohio, unfortunately, about um, access, uh, much less about even, honestly, a, a consistent survey for prevalence uh, and use. On the local level, we have seen coalitions through their logic modeling and their data gathering see that needle move and been able to um, analyze their level of contribution to both youth access as well as youth consumption. Um, parents who host as any other prevention strategy is one prong on a many pronged fork um, when you're dealing with underage drinking. Um, so things all point in the right direction. It's going to certainly depend on what the community is doing and what else they're marrying it with. Um, but there is good local level information we get from a number of coalitions about the success they're seeing and that they, they do attribute that contribution um, to parents who host as one of the prongs, certainly on their on their tool their tool fork. Thank you, Allison. And this question is for Ber from Berna. Uh, how do you handle parents that you know are hosting underage drinking parties and feel it's okay? Uh, well, there's uh, combinations of things that you can do. Uh, there's the parents know the facts that really focuses on um, not only the legal implications of social hosting but also the health and safety. Um, to help them understand that really it's not something that, uh, while it's, it's not illegal, it's certainly not healthy for their, ch their child. And in fact, most students don't uh, drink alcohol on a regular basis. So you can kind of work on reinforcing some of those community norms. Um, and also, um, certainly the connection with law enforcement is a, a key piece. If they are coming out publicly saying that um, we're not going to tolerate parents hosting underage drinking parties, um, then that might be a tool that will be helpful as well. Um, but again, look at your community and see what you might work best. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer parent uh, might be the best angle in really having that conversation because um, we know that as students get older, um, it can be, uh, it'll feel like there's additional pressures to allow underage drinking. Um, but if there's a community norm that says that it's not acceptable, um, then parents will feel that they are supported by the community um, by making the decision not to host. Um, we have about two minutes left, so we will finish up these last questions. And again, if you have additional questions, you can feel free to ask them in the question section, or you can email me at dlongmire at drugfreeactionalliance.org. Um, does Drug Free Action Alliance also support responsible drinking with legal adults? Uh, if so, is there an abstinence or limited drinking program? Alice, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, certainly, as an agency, we look at environmental change and prevention across the lifespan, and research does support that um, most adults can consume alcohol in low-risk or moderate ways. The unfortunate reality is too many adults in our world don't know their low-risk guidelines or what drinking in moderation means for them because it is different for everybody. We don't currently have a program that we've created. Um, I do know that there are multiple programs out there that do address adult use uh, appropriately. Um, one recommendation might be Prevention Research Institute and their Prime for Life if you're looking for a curriculum. Uh, I also know that in Cincinnati, the Alcoholism Council has recently developed a low-risk drinking curriculum. Um, and we can put you in touch if you shoot me an email or Derek an email. We can get you the email address for Lori Higgins. Um, and that's uh, been so far uh, a, a a nice curriculum that's a short, I think it's more like a two or two to three hour piece um, that focuses on adult use of alcohol. Um, it is something that, that I know for me I felt strongly about philosophically as a preventionist that we need to focus more on adults as well as, as youth. Um, we just currently right now at Drug Reaction Alliance don't, don't have a program like that. Thank you, Allison. It is, uh, an hour has passed. Um, we do have a couple other questions, but before we answer those questions, just so we're mindful of everyone's time, wanted to let you know the two webinars that we have upcoming. Um, the next is on December 10th, featuring Buzzkill, Serve Under 21, and the party's over. And the following webinar would be January 14th in 2014.
and that focus is the big bowl vote uh, get in the game and that really looks at um, the Super Bowl and the advertisements uh, that are shown on the, during the Super Bowl and the impact that might have on um, students and kind of their perceptions of alcohol marketing. I uh, also want to just remind you that we will be sending out a survey of the session. Uh, we really want to assess the value of um, what you learned today and to help us determine what future webinar topics um, you might be looking for. Um, also, it's a great opportunity for us to see what we can continue to improve upon. Since this is a monthly series, uh, we want to make sure that we get be better as we move along. Going back to our questions, um, when students ask us uh, as professionals if we drink alcohol, how do we honestly respond to them? As a responsible adult, I, I have a drink on occasion. Thank you, Mark, for that question. Um, I think honesty is always the best policy if you have to answer the question, because a lot of times I don't know that you do. Um, we all make our personal decisions, and uh, whether it's whether or not we drink alcohol or who we vote for for president. So um, some of those things, I think it's okay to say that uh, that's not really the focus of what you're talking about. Um, for them, it's important to underscore the um, effects of brain development, um, the legality behind underage drinking, and really focus on the there's reasons as to why uh, alcohol is made legal for those who are of legal age uh, and illegal for those who are minors. Allison, did you want to add to that? Uh, not, uh, not to add to that, but just because uh, we're, we're really at our time, we did have a request to see the two webinar dates again and to see your contact information just as we're wrapping up. That's our last two things. I think we're done with questions. And again, the webinar dates are December 10th and January 14th. You can access those at drugfreeactionalliance.org and from there you can go to our events page. And my contact information is will be on your screen shortly. It's There we go. Uh, and you can contact me at 614-540-9985 extension 16 or dlongmire at drugfreeactionalliance.org. Thank you all for your time and your attendance. Uh, we hope that you will join us on December 10th for Buzzkill, Serve Under 21, and the party's over. I really look forward to your feedback related to this uh, webinar uh, so we can continue to make things better as we move along. Thank you, and have a wonderful afternoon.